announcements before we get the scripture for tithing and offering. Uh, Tuesday, we have a prayer group here in the building at uh, 7 to 8.30. Bring your petitions, bring a friend, bring some prayers, and we'll get busy. Uh, I think we're still doing the Bible study on at Vanessa's house on Thursdays again for this the rest of this month. Mm -hmm. We have uh, other things to do on Fridays, this upcoming two Fridays. And uh, if you don't know the address to Vanessa's, just uh, ask one of us and we'll be more than happy to give it to you. So, and, uh, and then uh, this upcoming Saturday, there's prayer group on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock from 8 to 9.30. And um, again, bring your petitions, bring a friend, and just come and uh, fellowship with us, and we'll get working, praying, doing the Lord's work. So um, if uh, anybody needs an envelope, please raise your hand. CJ would be more than happy to give you one. If you're not going to tie an offer um, today monetarily, you can do it online, and uh, you can just grab an envelope and put E on it, and put the amount, and you can do it online, it's a secure web page, and uh, you have no worries about doing that. All right, uh, for scripture, can you guys please go to Second Corinthians nine six. Amen when you're there. <clears throat> Alright. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. You know, here, you know, uh, just says, you know, you know, give with a good, give with a happy heart, and uh, God will be more than happy to bless you. Give with a, a bitter heart. I don't think you're going to get no blessings. <laughs> Amen. So CJ's going to go around and collect the tithe and offering. Uh, all right, everybody just put our hands up together, and uh, we we'll bless the offering for this week. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us the strength, the courage, and the ability to get up every day to provide for our family, to be able to tithe and offer to you to your works, Lord. We want to thank you for our everlasting mercy and grace that you put upon our lives. We want to thank you for salvation, Lord. We want to thank you especially for your son, Jesus. We want to thank you for everything you have done for us today, and if it is your will, tomorrow, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we today we're in for we're we're not we're we're, we're we don't have our pastor today uh, but we are we do have we are blessed with Jeff today. Okay, oh, yes, he's a pastor too, but I'm saying we have Pastor Claudio here and he's yeah. over down south in Sacramento. Yeah, he, he's he's uh, preaching at a different church. At a different church. <laughs> <laughs> but we are blessed to have Jeff today in his lovely word. Lovely. It's lovely work. It's the beautiful work. There you go. Yeah. The beautiful work. Let's see if I can meet my my. Uh... Are these your notes right here? Yeah, but I, I tried to have them here. Oh, look at that came up. Okay. Hmm. Maybe. <laughs> Praise God. Good man. <laughs> about today, we are talking about the two being one flesh. The, uh, what I labeled it um, right in God. Right in God. And you know, 
not right in God is implying sort of lots of, well, let's pray. Father God, we just come before your presence, Lord, and we ask that it be your words, not mine. Plow hearts, prepare the way, God, we just pray that you would just anoint your word. In Jesus' name, we just pray that you'd anoint your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so positioning. When we're talking about positioning, their positioning is pretty important. If you're out of position, then you don't receive what you're supposed to receive. If you're on a basketball team and you're out of position when the guy throws the basketball, you don't get it. You know? You see the guy in this football season, you see the guy, if he's out of position, that quarterback throws the ball and there's nobody there to catch it. And so, uh, being out of position, God, he has like these blessings that he wants to pour from heaven. Right? He pours them out. But if you're out of position, that blessing misses you. Right? Right? If you're not in position, he pours it out. Oh, hey, that, that, that's like two feet off to the side of you. You just got the splashes of that blessing. You know? <laughs> and, you know, so when we're out of position, positioning is really important. So that goes to say, what? how do you be in position? And really, at the heart, that's really at the heart of this, this little message, right? And so, let's, let's uh, go to Romans chapter 5. And I forgot the number of my pages. I hate it when I do that. Now I've got to be really careful not to put them out of order. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to read Romans chapter 5 out of uh, the King James Version. And... Uh, and it says this. There being justified what is that there? Are we there on the overhead? Not yet? Getting there. Getting there? Almost? Right, we're just starting in verse one, chapter five, verse one. And it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes on and says, By whom also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope of glory, of, of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribula tribulation work of patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would a righteous man die for a uh, righteous man will die for would one what, whoops. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, for, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then, um, so that scripture right there, is all about, it's a hint, hinting towards positioning in God. And this is a little bit of a different, different angle of this, but I hope it brings some clarity to you today. All right, so first, first let's look at some of these words, right? In verse 1 it says, therefore being justified by faith. Well, what is justified? What's justified? It's a uh, dikeu. I can't pronounce. I'm terrible with other languages. Okay, but it means to make right, to render just, to um, avouch to be good and true, to vindicate, to set forth as good and trust. Right, uh, a whole bunch of different things, and and it's pretty interesting that that God uses that word there, justified by faith. Um, Justified is sort of like qualified, the word qualified. 
You know, I used to have a big, there was a time in my life when I had a problem, I really started having problems praying for people. Because only one, two, five percent or however many did I see the answer actually happen. Right? And I was like, well, the Bible says that in the end times they will have a form, form of godliness but not know the power thereof. And I was really, and the devil was using that scripture to, to heckle me. To heckle me. Right? Because, because I would pray for somebody and I wouldn't see the answer right away. Right? And I was like, well, that's a powerless prayer. Right? That's a powerless prayer. Right? Because the signs of, of that Jesus is alive is the fulfillment of those prayers. Right? That, and the sign that you are a child of God and that you're filled with the Spirit of God is these mighty things happening. When you pray, God answers. When you, right? But that was, the problem was is that I was all about the outward thing. Right? I was, I was concerned with what was happening in other people's eyes. And not concerned with what was happening inside here. Right? And the, the biggest testimony isn't really what other people, when other people see because see, all those testimonies have already happened. Jesus has already come. He's already risen the dead. He's already came back to life. Right? He's already done all those things. The testimony that Jesus is alive only need to be our witness. Right? Although God still heals. And he still saves. And he still delivers. And many times he'll do it right through our prayer. You know, I remember times when God done miracles without me even being there. I remember one time a lady called me from the hospital, Caroline, and she had a, a blood clot in her leg. And the doctors were saying, hey, you know, we're really worried this is going to kill you. You know, and, and she's really worried. And, and her daughter called me. I mean, her daughter was there. And she called me and said, I need you to pray. I'm really afraid. And I, and I didn't have time to go to the hospital and pray for her. Right? And I go, who is in the room with you? And, and she said, my daughter is in the room. Who? It was not, a, was not a believer in Christ, right? But she got in line and I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to lay hands on your mom. And I want you, I want you to command healing through Christ in the name of Christ. And she done it, right? And I prayed with her over the phone. And, she, and you know what happened? God healed her. She called me the next day and said, it's gone. God took it away. The whole blood clot is gone, right? Now, I, I wonder if that would have happened if I would have went up there and prayed myself. But see, that, that testimony was a girl that didn't believe it could happen, really, but then seen it happen. It was for her. The healing was for the daughter, right? It was for the daughter, for her witness, because she can never say God did not move. She's going to have to say, I prayed, and God done it. <laughs> right? I, on the other hand, I know God can move. I don't need that witness. Right? I go because I have a heart for the lost, and I want to see them healed and stuff. But, this is, and this is a fine point. We all love our people, you know, and we want to see them healed. But in the end, you know, even Lazarus went back to the grave. Right? I mean, it's almost, God does it, it's, it's almost, almost a waste of time for God, right? Almost a waste of time. Because he'll heal the body just for it to go back to the grave, right? And then when we depart from this tent, we get a glorified body that doesn't have sickness, right? So he's already given us a glorified body that doesn't have sickness. He, he's already done all this work that already proves he's Christ. What is his only benefit for doing the healing, right? Well, he does it because he still loves us, right? He says, okay, I'll do it. I'll still heal you. I'll still heal your loved one. But really, it's, it's almost, if you look at it through logic, it's unlogical. Right? Why would he do it? It's because he has a promise to keep, right? And he, and he, has, he still has a witness to do. Now that witness, and, and this is why in third world countries that don't know God, you'll see mighty miracles happening there. Someone will come in from, from the United States or from some other country that has a testimony that rarely done miracles or anything, that God rarely performed miracles or anything in their home country. But when they get to some other country where the, where the testimony says, yes, Jesus is real and he's risen and alive, and they're like, oh, that's where God will do those miracles. It's amazing. And he'll do them bountifully. But 
Here we see justified, right? Justified by faith. It's still the justification for God, right? He's he still is still a witness to us. All those things, they still scream to our ears and speak to our hearts that Jesus is risen, right? That he is alive and that he keeps his promises. And then the word faith there, I'm just going to touch for a second. Uh, faith, you know, only in the King James Version, only only appears like one or two times. I think maybe, maybe three, I can't remember. Very few times the word faith in the King James Version of the Old Testament. It's amazing. And you'd think something that was so important would be there, you know, as much as it is in the New Testament. But the thing is, is that sometimes we, we think of faith as being the supernatural stuff that that is that is um, magical. You know, it's it's sort of a, a different element. And and we sort of lose it there because really tr what faith is is just simply uh, if you look at the same words that the word faith is translated from in the Old Testament, it all it's it, that word that that Hebrew word appears many times, but only three times is it translated into the word faith. All the rest of the times it's translated translated into the word truth, mostly, right? And so, and not just any truth, the truth that God performs, right? So it's so faith. The real, the real definition of faith according to the Old Testament, New Testament is, is believing what God says is the truth. Right? That's what faith is. Believing that what God says is the truth. Believing it's the truth to the point of action. Right? Believing it's so true that you're willing to act on it and, and move on it. Set your life upon it. Position your life upon it. Right? It's, we can believe, I mean, we go to work every day because we believe it's true that if we go to work that we will earn a paycheck and they'll pay us. Right? That's, that's action. And we're, that action we're doing is because we're believing a truth. Right? That we're believing that they'll pay us. Because if we believe they would never pay us, we'd never go to work. Right? So we go to work and we believe we're going to get paid. We, we serve God because we believe what he says is true. And there's lots of things that he says. Um, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Living Bible puts it this way. So now, since we have been made right in God's sight, right, and that's why I originally named it being right with God, being, being made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, Right? In other words, by believing Him, we can have real peace with Him because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And uh, many of you guys know that I've been reading the Passion Bible lately, and I've done a little review of that on, on the blog. But uh, the Passion Bible says it this way. And our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us, and He now declares us flawless in His eyes. <laughs> You know, I like that a little bit because uh, how many have, have seen, um, let me think of that, the name of that, um, A Knight's Tale, the movie A Knight's Tale. Yeah, that movie A Knight's Tale, that was one of my favorites, right? But it was, it was, it was when the boy, right, the boy is sitting there and the knights are riding by and, and the, the guy in stocks is sitting there and, and, uh, and the boy says, I want to be a knight. And the guy in the stocks laughs. <laughs> yeah, right. You might as well change, change, you know, change the stars, he says. You might as well believe that you can change the stars. And he looks over to his dad and he says, Dad, is it true? Can it be done? Can we change the stars? And his dad says, yes, William. You can change the stars. You can change the stars. Right? And I was so moved by that. But then, later... When he's grown up and he, and he assumes the knight's identity and he goes around and he acts, was acting like a knight. Then he gets found out and he gets put in the stocks. And then what happens? The, the black prince, right? The prince of Wales comes up and says, My historians have revealed that he is uh, of noble birth from way back. 
right? And that he is this and he is that. And because it's my word, it's incontestable. Right? And then he knights him right there. Sir William. And his trust, he becomes a knight. Right? And, and so right here it says this. It says, and to us he now declares us flawless in his eyes. Declares, see, Jesus is the king of kings. Right? What he says is uncontestable, is incontestable. Nobody can say it's wrong. Right? What he says, that's it. It doesn't matter if history, if that's history or not. See, see the power of that? It doesn't matter what your history is. Right? It doesn't matter where you came from or what you think, who you think you are because of your transgressions. Right? Are you willing to believe God? And say, and have faith, what God says is the truth. Right? We just covered that. Right? And what he, right here he's saying, he's, he says, I declare him flawless. I declare her flawless and righteous. That is my word. I'm king of kings. And as king of kings, it's uncontestable. They, so, not only all them, those people, not only they, have to believe it, but guess who else has to believe it when he says that? You. you have to believe it. Right? You have to believe it. That's positioning. See, you're positioning through faith by believing God. Right? You're positioning yourself to receive the blessing of God. Right? You can easily say, God's a liar, that's not true, as so many people do. And maybe not outright. Right? Many people come to Christ and, and say they believe, but then they, they never change. They go back to the world. Right? Why? Because they never believed what God told them. Right? They didn't believe it when God says, I declare. The King of Kings stands up and says, I declare. I declare you princess Right? A knight. You are knighted. Amen. It's beautiful. Right? And I'm going to try to stop saying right. My daughter used to tell me, Dad, you say right after every sentence. You've got to stop. <laughs> so I, I, I hear that, that her, her voice still in the back of my mind. Dad. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's, some, there's another word in here that I want to look at a little bit. And it's further down. Let's jump back to verse 9 right here. We're going we're gonna to jump over all that stuff. Right? That's a whole other message. But we're going to pick it back up in verse, verse, actually verse 8. But God commended his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified. Okay, then now it's past things, right? Right? Now, now you've understood, you've believed that God is telling you the truth. Right? It, now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For once we were enemies. Okay. So positioning in God. Point two. No longer enemies. Right? The world is condemned already. Right? The Bible says that God didn't, Jesus didn't come to the earth to condemn the world because, but to seek and save lost because the world is condemned already. That means that the people of the world are the enemies of God. Right? They're the enemies of God. Because they live life unto death instead of life unto life. Right? So that's a hard place to realize that you're coming from. That you're coming from a place that you're the enemy of God. But it is so true. Back when I, I remember when I was a drug dealer, there's no doubt I wasn't doing anything to help anybody, that's for sure. Right? I had nothing to help. I remember, I remember when, back when I was um, trying to, when I was a young man, I was so focused on myself, you know. All I cared about was me, 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 me. That's definitely not God. 
So the enemies of God, and I got this out of order, I don't know why, our faith in Jesus Christ transfers God's righteousness to us, and now he declares us flawless in his eyes. Um, this means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace. This is the Passion Translation. With God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access unto this marvelous kindness that, this, that, that has given us perfect relationship with God. Relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us from uh, within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. So if while we were yet sinners, God fully reconciled, and there's a little note here, it says the Greek verb of reconciled is actually exchanged. That is, he exchanged our sins for his righteousness and thus reconciled us to God. The reign of death is caused by the guilt of sin. Right? So, again, our past, right? So we tend to believe our past over what God says, and that brings us to that place. Uh, and then it goes on, um, he brings us to himself through the death of some, some. Uh, sometimes greater than friendship is ours. Something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, so it brings us into resurrection life. And so enemies of God. Um, let's look at this. Uh, wrath. The enemies of God suffer the wrath of God. Okay. So a couple things about wrath. Romans 1, 18 and 19 says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men, who suppose, who suppress the truth of, in unrighteousness. Right, so wrath means, uh, if I can read it here, hot anger or passion, for which anger notes, uh, paragamos, to provoke, to anger. But see, and so it says that in the time of judgment, the white seat, the white, the great white throne judgment. I guess I'm going to put this over here. I'm not going to use it. Great right, white throne judgment, the wrath of God is poured out. In Revelations, right, there's the cups of wrath that are poured out. Where the blood runs as high as, as a, the, the uh, harness on a horse. On earth, that's what it says. That's how, how much wrath is poured out. That, that uh, almost everything living in the ocean is killed. Right, the wrath of God is poured out. But so... As, as enemies of God, you expect to find wrath in your life. The wrath of God. You, you really don't have anything to say. You can't say, you can't depend on the goodness of God because you're not serving Him. But for us, it's a different story. Right? The Bible says we're not given unto wrath. Right? The saved person is not given unto wrath. Right? We're not, because these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, is what it says in Colossians, in which you yourselves walked and were at one time. Right? But you're no longer a child of disobedience, right? And in Ephesians it says, we lived among them at one time in the cravings of our flesh, indulging in, in its desires and thoughts like the rest of the world. We were, by nature, children of wrath. Mm -hmm. right? So, the wrath of God in there. Uh, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he that does not believe in the Son shall not see life, and even the, the wrath of God abides on him. That's what it says in John 3, 35-36. So, the wrath of God abides, rests, lives there. Right? Because there, he's, the, what is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is separation. Right? Separation from him. There's no life outside of God. So anything that does not have life is going to hell. Everything that's dead goes to hell. Only the living go to hell. Everything that's dead goes to hell. 
So, you know, if when you cross over, when you meet your maker, if your soul is in a state of life, then you go where the light living go. But if your soul is not in a state of life, then you don't go there. You go to hell. And hell is only a holding place. And then eventually you end up in the lake of fire. That's where all these people that you see, when you go outside and walk around, and they're not saved, every single one of them, that's where they're going. It's already done. The world is condemned already. It's not that they're getting a judgment. They were born into that judgment. Right? They're, it's not that they, they've done so wickedly that they deserve it, although many have, and some haven't. The nicest guy that has never sinned in his life or done anything horrible, bad, but does not believe on the name of Jesus Christ is still going to hell. You might think you're a good person. But it doesn't matter how good you are because you cannot purchase heaven with you, what you do with your own works. You can't do it. Right? So positioning isn't whether you're doing right or wrong. Positioning yourself to receive blessings isn't whether you're a good person or a bad person or whether you give to the poor and the hungry or help the hopeless. Right? All those things are good. Right? Don't get me wrong. But that doesn't get you into heaven. Now, it will give you riches once you are in heaven. Right? There is a reward for all the good things that you do if you're here, if you're there. Right? If you believed on the name of Christ, the Bible says that there is a great right for throne judgment for you too, and you will receive those that do good what is their reward. Goodness for the things they've done. And for those that receive evil, evil for the things they've done. And the Bible says, don't be mocked. God is not mocked, right? Whatever is a man so that shall he receive. And that's after that. But for us, in Romans 5, this, the verses that we're reading, it says, Much more than having now been justified by his lust, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Right? So, for those that believe, that trust God, right? that are chosen, right? we're saved from wrath. glorious. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of the Son. We already read that several times. What is the word reconciled? Reconciled. To restore to friendship. Right? Harmony. Uh, to resolve differences. To reconcile. Uh, comes from a word... Uh, Irene, I can't pronounce half these things, and it means peace, literally or fi figuratively, by implication, prosperity, even. <laughs> to set at one again, and that is the key definition, mm -hmm. to set at one again. You see, the word reconciliation is most commonly used in divor divorce procedures. Right? You can choose to reconcile your marriage or dissolve it. Right? Reconciliation. To reconcile. And you know, most of what God talks about is along those lines. It's, it's talking about a marriage. And not only so, but we also joy. Okay, that's the rest of that verse. Um, wow. Wow. I'm out of order again. It says, uh, let me read this part. I'm going to skip back just a sec for a second here because I'm going to read this a couple. We're talking, we went ahead to reconciliation, but there's a couple things right here I want to, I want to show. Uh, in verse 14, it said, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. All right, so death reigned from Adam to Moses. Actually, from Adam to to the second Adam. But it says, Adam was even over them that had not sinned. 
after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So that we were just talking about that, right? Death is still reigning whether you do right or wrong. Right? And and not, and then verse 16 it says, and not as it was by one that sinned, so it is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. Right? The condemnation of the world. I'm just backing up what I just said, right? A little bit. Just to show you that it's all scripture. Right? So it says, for one, the world became condemned, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So that's where we're moving. The free gift. And then verse 18, it says, uh, Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. Now, that's all who believe. Right? All men have, all men and women have the opportunity to believe and trust God. The, the free gift is available, but you still have to choose to take it. You still have to choose to receive it. Verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered, and the offense might abound. But where, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. And the sin hath reigned unto death. And even so, might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the Living Bible says it this way in verse 5. Uh, so now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ has done. And then skipping down, verse 9, it says, Now he will save us. This is the living, the living Bible. You know, when you're studying the Word of God and look at the Word, it's good to look at different translations, right? Because they put it differently. And some of them are paraphrases and stuff, but it helps you to think about, what is God really trying to tell me here? How is he positioning? How is he trying to prepare my heart? Is it, you know, so here, here he says it just a little bit different in the Living Bible. And I love the Living Bible. Now he will save us from all God's wrath to come. So we can see that the world is born in condemnation and the wrath of God abides, it lives with, it abides on the children of disobedience. But we have the opportunity as believers not to be taking part of that wrath. But, if, but in fact it says that we, we will be saved from all God's wrath. And since when we were his enemies, so that's how we know that the world is considered God's enemy. The person that you see that is unsafe, he's the enemy of God. Don't expect him, don't expect a worldly person to do, want, do or want something of God unless they're influenced by the Holy Spirit or by somebody that loved them enough to bring them in. Right? Now, since we were his enemies, we were bought back to God, reconciled, right? Bought back to God by the death of his son, paid for. What blessings he must have for us now. So we now rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. <laughs> our wonderful new relationship with God. Let's get forward. So, this word relationship keeps on coming up in this, in this text, right? This word relationship keeps on coming up. So, what is God talking about? What, is this, what does this mean? How is this working? Well, we have to jet all the way back to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed in him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Where it says that, that breathed, that word breathed, when you really research it, it means that God tore off a piece of his spirit and he placed it in man. And because of the, the spirit of the Father was living in Adam, Adam became a living soul. He became alive. It was the life that was in the Father God that brought the soul of Adam to life. Right? So, but see, right there, that's a marriage. Right? Because the two, Adam and God, became one flesh. See? That's a marriage. The two, Adam and God, became one flesh at that moment. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate, the Bible says. Or don't you know that he who unites... Okay, that's another part. So, the marriage... Um, the Bible says that 
that man... Oh, here it is. Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 24. For this reason will man leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife, that they will become one flesh. Right? Really, there's only two institutions on earth that God created. One is the church. The bride of Christ is called, right? And the other is marriage. A mar marriage between... God, God made it right here. He created a marriage between a man and a woman. But it's really a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing of the relationship of God with, with us. Because here it says, the two become one flesh. See, in God, we didn't understand what was happening with Adam when God tore his spirit out and put him inside, put it inside of Adam, and the two, Adam and God, became one flesh. Right? The, God the Father. Okay, so they, they became married in, in, in that definition. And so the two main institutions, like we said, are the church and marriage. The bride, the church, is the bride. Now you see how God is, uh, it's already uh, alluding to this relationship that he's talking about, is this marriage, this covenant relationship where two become one flesh. Okay, the bride. Now Jesus is married to the church according to John 3.29. It says the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. According to Revelation 18.23, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will never be heard again because they're taken up. In Revelation 21.9, come, I will show you the bride. The bride again is the church. In John 13.21, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friends of the bridegroom stand and listen for him. And they are overjoyed to hear the bridegroom's voice. That is joy, that joy is mine, and it is now complete. The joy is complete. So you have this thing called the church that become that is called the bride, a select chosen people of God, right? And then uh, so in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, it says, So the last shall be first, first shall be last, and many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called it, but few are chosen. That's because when you're chosen by God, you're chosen to become his bride. Yeah, you become the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. The church is not the building. Right? It's the people. The people become the bride of, the bride of Christ. We become, me, it took me, I, I remember when I first learned that, I said, oh, what? But dude, man, I'm <laughs> But you have to understand what marriage really is. I mean, it, sure, it's a union among man, a man and woman in, in the flesh, but really it's where two become one flesh. Right? Two become one flesh. That's the definition of marriage put forth in Genesis. The two become one flesh. And so we see many allusions to that. Matter of fact, the whole, the whole thing that's lined out about about uh, salvation and everything, it, the whole thing alludes to a whole Jewish ceremony of being married. I mean, the marriage covenant. Uh, okay, so in a Jewish cer ceremony, right? You you uh, you go around say that you want you, you, you. I'm a guy and I'm attracted to this girl, right? And I, so I go to her and I offer her a cup of wine. If she takes the wine and drinks from it, she's accepting my proposal. Right? At that time, from that time on, she's betrothed. Right? She's gonna be my she's gonna be my wife and I'm gonna be your husband. But that is when we get married, right? She now has responsibility. She has to cover her face, right? Not reveal herself outside to other. She has to make a statement. That covering says, I am already betrothed. That's what that garment says. The garment says that. She's wearing a garment that says, I am not available anymore. I have, I'm betrothed. Right? And the bridegroom has a job. He goes back. If he's rich, he can go build a house. But if he's not rich, he goes back to his father's house. They build on a, a bridal chamber onto the house. Right? And then he works on that. He works on that bridal chamber. But he never gets to decide when it's done. The father of the bridegroom, every once in a while, periodically, goes and inspects the bridal chamber. Right? And, one, and eventually, when he comes through, he, 
He walks through it. Nope, it's not done yet. Nope, it's not done yet. Nope, it's not done yet. And then finally he says, oh, perfect, son. Go get your bride. Therefore, no one, now if you look at all that, you know, you look at the betrothal, the cup, right? Take and drink. The, this is my cup, the cup of, uh, in my blood, right? That's the cup. That's the wine, right? Right there. The, it shows it all through, right, the, the Bible. And then the betrothal, you're supposed to wear, the Bible says that uh, uh, there's, a, the, there's a place where they had a wedding and the guy showed up not in the right garments, or they showed up and he said, what are you doing here? Get out! Because he wasn't wearing the right, they weren't wearing the right garments, right? The, you, you have to be in a robe that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? Shh. You, have to, you have to be carrying the Spirit of Christ. You have to have the, the Spirit inside of you. Right garments, and that says on this earth you're you're wearing that garment on this earth, and they're going. There's something different about that person. There's something different about them. That you know the, the darkness. I remember when I first got saved, and I, I started going to church. And you know what happened? All those people that that wanted to be with be around me that were dark, you know, like drug dealers and all that stuff. They all left. They didn't want no part of life. I didn't even have to tell them to go. Right. They just naturally, because darkness doesn't want anything to do with light. All right? So, so and then, and then uh, go fetch your bride. So, like the marriage covenant, you know, in Acts chapter 20, in Corinthians, there's, there's many verses here uh, that I got written down, but I don't want to take that much time. Uh, the bride, in John 14, 3, is where Jesus goes, go get your bride, it says, right? Uh, the bride is cleansed, undergoes ritual cleansing. There's a bridal ceremony. The, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Right? The consummation. We're just going to back on set. <laughs> the marriage feast. Uh, the whole thing of salvation and your relationship with God follows along this idea of a relationship, married relationship. Where the two become one, one flesh. Uh, God and Jesus. Jesus was the first one to, to do it. He walked. I mean, Adam done it first, right? He had the Spirit of God and the Father in him, but he blew it to where he, he died, right? The Spirit had to leave, and the two were no, no longer one flesh. That was what caused the need for the reconciliation. The reconciliation is that Spirit has to live back inside of you for your soul to come back to life. That Spirit has to live back inside your soul. But Father God cannot live there because of sin. Right? So what they, that's why Jesus, he came to earth, right? He never sinned. Son of God, he carried the Father's spirit. Uh, it says, uh, but I, I uh, John 10, chapter, thir uh, chapter 10, verse 38, but if I am doing, even though you do not believe me, believe the works themselves so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. The two are one flesh. Two or one flesh. In John chapter 14, verse 10, do you not believe that I am I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me who performs these works. See, this two or one flesh. They're married in biblical terms. Now, biblical, not 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 the world's definition of biblical terms, okay? The actual biblical terms, right? Biblical terms say that to be married, the two become one flesh. Okay? So believing in John chapter 14, verse 11, believing me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least, or at least believe, count on the works themselves. So Jesus, he's saying, listen, Adam blew it. He couldn't stay married to God. I, I'm, I'm not going to blow it. And he didn't. All the way up to where he took the sin, our sins. Right? But he still didn't blow because it wasn't his sin. God separated himself off of, off of him when he was on the cross because of our sins, of the sins of the world. And that's what caused Jesus to go to hell, be into the earth. But he remained married to God. And even now, Jesus is still married to the Father. How do I know that? Because when you receive the Son, you receive the Father. The Father God is still in the Son. He, he's, 
still in there. He's still married to Jesus. And, and now, he's, Jesus became the bridegroom. And we become married to the bridegroom. That means the two become one flesh. We're not talking about a dead person here. We're talking about a living entity, a living person, Jesus Christ, right? Who lives inside of you. You, you should be able to hear him. You should be able to feel him. You should be able to know when he's upset, when he's happy, when he's sad, when, he, when he's delighted, when he feels love. You should be able to feel that because he lives inside of you. He's supposed to anyway. That's the whole idea. The whole idea is that you become the bride of Christ. And in biblical terms, that means that the two become one flesh. The two become one flesh. So, in fact, when you get saved, what do you say? Lord, come into, what? What do you say? Lord, come into my heart and live in me and be my Lord and Savior. You're asking a living being, who is Lord of all, yes, to live in you. Now, the world would have you think, have you just say the words and think that you just go on your life and that there is no, nothing else happens on the inside of you, that nobody lives or moves into you. But that's not salvation. Salvation is that Jesus comes, abides in you. He comes and lives in you. Now Jesus is resurrected. He's alive. We're talking about a living person living inside of you. You see? Now, understanding, the Bible says that, that if you really want to know that I have the scriptures, get the understanding of the scriptures. Get the understanding of the scriptures, right? Now, this is a hard thing, because some of this stuff is like, what in the world are you preaching? What are you saying to me? Right? You, you're, you're telling me that, that, that I'm the host of some parasite called Jesus? <laughs> no. He's not a parasite. Right? Because he only wants good. A parasite eats you. <laughs> but God, Jesus, he brings you to life. Right? I live, yet it is not I that live, but Christ that what? Dwells in me. Do you see? Do you see? It's a marriage. It's a marriage. There's, I'm crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, right? In other words, that little qualifier says, this is for now, this is for this body, right? This thing right here, the life that I now live in the flesh, I'm alive inside here. This is only a tent. I live inside the tent. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of some God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 4, 2. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond. Unity implies united. United. Jesus promises that, you know, uh, on that day you will know that I am I am the Father, I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is chapter John, chapter 19, I think. Whosoever has my commandment and keeps them is the one who loves me. But he's saying, I'm in the Father, he's in me, and I am in you. I'm in you, and you are in me. The two become one flesh. And that day you will no longer ask me anything but truly, truly, I tell you whatsoever you ask me. In the Father's name it shall be done, of course. And the day, uh, in that day you will ask me and I will give it to you. Are you getting the, the positioning here? The positioning has nothing to do with works. It has to do with knowing the scripture and understanding it and receiving the truth of God. 
The truth of God is that as a believer and a chosen person, you are the bride of Christ. And in biblical terms, that doesn't mean that male and female. It means that you have both spirits, both living entities living inside of one flesh. In Jesus, you're there, and he's there. In you, he's there, and you're there. Not just you. And this is why, this is why you got to watch what you watch, because it's not only you looking at it, Amen. right? Right? You want to go off and watch pornography? Guess what? You're going to drag Jesus there, and he's going to have to see it. Is that what you want? Hey, Jesus, let your chick out your lap? It's like, oh, my God, what are you doing? You know? And the truth is, it says, pluck out your eye, cut off your hand. Right? That's what he says, right? <laughs> He's not joking. He's serious. He's saying, listen, I'm in here. Everything, everywhere you go, I'm in there. Everything you see, I see. Everything you say, I hear. And when I speak, you better be hearing me and listen. Don't, don't think I'm not there. Two people, right? He's alive. Now, many of us, we just treat, treat it like that Jesus never is, rose from the dead, that he's dead. They never came back. Oh, God, come back to my heart. Now I don't hear him. I don't see him. I don't, nothing. Right? I just go, I don't care. I'm, I'm hearing voices. The world. Oh, he's 5150. <laughs> he's hearing voices. You know, many people cannot handle the revelation that there's more than what you can see and feel here in this natural world. Amen. But the world, the Bible says that everything that you can see was created by that which you cannot see. Everything. In fact, when we touch this thing, we think we're touching this, that this is solid. But even science will tell you that this is 90% open space. Empty space in between molecules. It's just almost a fallacy, almost a lie that we can touch it. And feel it. You know, it's amazing. So what do I got to say? I'm going to leave you with these warnings. And here's the warnings. God is a jealous God. He's a jealous husband. Right? He's, he's a jealous husband. He ain't going to like it if you're looking with carnal eyes at the opposite sex. He's just not going to like it. Right? Because he's your mate. Right? He's, off, he, he's your mate. Right? And that is betrayal. That's, that's, that's a adultery. Right? He's just not going to like it. He lives in it. He's your mate. He's not going to like it. Right? It says, For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Know it. He doesn't, he, he's not trying to hide it. Right? He not, he not, he's, not, he's not saying, he's not trying to Make himself, you know how us guys, you know, we always become a little bit better than we actually are to try to attract the, the girl that we want. And then once we got her, then we let her see the real us. <laughs> right? God's not like that, though. Right? The girls do it, too. Don't smile. I know they do. <laughs> the girls, they, they get all dolled up. And, and uh, uh, what was it? Keisha? Keisha, the singer, is that her name? Keisha? Kesha? Kesha? Have you seen her without makeup? She has more freckles than you can imagine. And I'm not saying that's bad, but it, when you see her in her in her regular pictures, not a freckle one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but she's trying to present something other than what she does for whatever purpose. Makes her money. I understand that's her that's her employment. But we we often God's not that way. He tells you straight up, listen, I'm jealous. Right? You wanna you wanna get me mad? You want, to, you want some of my wrath? You want to know that side of me? Go ahead and do some of these things that you know that a jealous husband will not like. <laughs> it's pretty simple, right? Uh, Hosea says, uh, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and in steadfast love and mercy. He's not, it's straightforward, right? Uh, 
for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Right? Paul says that to the people that he ministered to. He, but he, I said that, I showed that scripture because, you know, when, when the disciples of Christ, when the people, oh, we know that you were following him because the way you are, the way you talk, the way you act. Right? Same thing. I mean, here's Paul, you know, he, he's jealous for the people that he led to the Lord. Jealous over them, you know. God is jealous over his people. And I'm almost done. I see that yawn. Uh, Second Peter, submit yourselves to the Lord. And so, here's, there's only a couple of things that, that I want to hound on. Right? It says, uh, where's the scripture? I forgot to put it in here. Oh, here it is. Ephesians 5.22. Okay, so, whether you like it or not, guys, girls have no problem with it, but the guys do, you are considered the bride of Christ. Right? And that's a feminine attribute. Feminine attribute. God is the bridegroom. He's the husband. Jesus takes on the masculine attribute. And he has to, because he's the king of kings. Right? He has to have authority and, and show power and all those things. And also says, the Bible says that he cannot change. Right? Who he is is who he's going to be. And that's who he is. Throughout the Bible of time, he's the father. Jesus showed up as a man. You know, uh, he, it's always male attributes. Always male attributes. God shows up in him. And, uh, and that's not popular today, because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, things going around that try to give God feminine attributes. And, and although God does have a heart that weeps and all that stuff, uh, like, like that could be considered feminine attributes, his main attribute is masculine. And that means we, as the church, take on the feminine, at, feminine, feminine attribute. Wives, and this is what God says to the wives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. In other words, submit, we can even jumble that around. Submit to the Lord just like you would your husband. Uh-oh. <laughs> what it's meaning is that, hey, this is practice. Now we, we practice too. It says in husbands, uh, love, your, love your wives like Christ did and he died for them. Christ died for him. Right? You, got, you better love your wife to, to die for her. Well, that's also practice. What's a practice for? It's practice for the, the relationship between us and God. Right? That's the practice. It's, it's, it's uh, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether it to be a king, a supreme authority, or governors who are sent I don't know why I have that verse there. Oh, for it is God's will, it says in verse 15. To submit. God's will. And here it says, wives, submit. Now, I think that this verse wasn't put here to tell a wife how to submit to her husband. Right? Really, I don't. I think that that was put there to tell us as the bride how to submit to the bridegroom. Right? For us as the bride... Because the marriage between a man and a woman is nothing but a foreshadowing of the marriage between God and man. Right? It, it, it's, it's to help you relate and understand what marriage is. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're married to God. You know, we have we have this other person living inside of us. Surely marriage on earth is just that foreshadowing. You know, and that's that's what it's all about. It's a chosen. That means you've been chosen. You know, uh, the Bible says there's some vessels of honor and some of dishonor. Right? You can be a vessel of honor or of dishonor. A vessel of dishonor is like a bed pan. Right? It holds all the waste of the world. That's the wrath of God, see. 
all the people that are not holding the thing of value inside them, carrying the thing of value, which is God, Jesus, your husband, are you are carrying something. Right? You're carrying something. If you're not carrying God, you're carrying something. And that's all the dishonorable stuff. It's, the, it's all the yuck that has, is looking for some home. The Bible says that God cleaned out, threw them all out of this place, and and uh, and then they went around looking for set, the spirit went around looking for another home, couldn't find any. So he went and got seven worse, bunch of spirits worse than him, and said, "We're going to go back to that place and move back in." Right? That's what it's talking about. Those people that don't have the the thing that's honorable are not the chosen bride of Christ. They're carrying those other spirits. And guess what? They're slaves to those things. They're bound. They're slaves. We have liberty and freedom because we have a husband and a king and a lord that gives us that freedom. He lives inside of us, brings us to life, but still, he does not push us around. Right? You have to choose and you know what? Here's how it works. If you're a new Christian out there, I'm talking to you too. In the beginning, God is going to talk to you like this. You're going to hear him nice and loud. And then through your walk, he's going to start getting quieter. Pretty soon he's going to talk to you like this, to where you have to listen a little bit. And pretty soon he's going to get a little bit quieter. You're going to have to really start listening. Listen. Okay, is that, is that God? That's, that's God's whisper. He's whispering. And include, and indeed, he says, still small voice. God wasn't in the hurricane or the lightning or the thunder, but a still small voice spoke. And it's because that's how you learn to recognize the voice of God. Right? He gets you to where you can't. You know it's him, right? Without a doubt. Because he's thundering in you. And then that tapers off slower and slower and slower and slower. And many times when we get down to where he's talking slight, small, we, we misbelieve and we think that maybe he departed or he's not there. But he's still there. He's just being very quiet. And he's being quiet so that you can learn. He wants you to be attentive. He wants you to be listening. Is God speaking? No. I think I heard it. Is that him? Uh, the Bible says, test the spirits and see if they're of God. Is that him? Oh, wait, wait a minute. They're talking about lying. That's not God. Test the spirits and see if they're of God. Uh, it says that it, only through the spirit of God can, can you say that Jesus is risen and is Lord of all, son of God. Jesus risen and Lord of all? Yes? Are you Lord? Come in, my good and faithful servant chosen of my love. And now are you got homework. Now you know what and who you're married to. So there is one book of the Bible that is pinpointed on this relationship. And it's Song of Songs. And it's very intimate. Very intimate. And it's hard to understand if you're looking at it wrong set of eyes, not understanding that you are the bride of Christ and that he's the bridegroom. But once you really understand that, and you understand that there's two become one flesh, now when you read the Song of Solomon, you'll see your husband, Jesus, talking to his bride. And that's how he sees you. Very intimate. And there is no better husband and that's what I have for you today. All right? So let's close in prayer. I used up all my time. Father God, we just come before your presence right now, Lord. And I, we, we would ask that you just teach us to know your voice. Help us to feel your heart. Lord, help us to, to have your thoughts, your eyes. God, move ever closer to us, God, that we 
that we be the mate that you dream us to be. Help us, God, to be the mate that you dream us to be. And it's, it's a little bit weird to say that, but, but it's biblical. Because, Jesus, you are the bridegroom, and we are the bride. So help us, God. Lord, and as we go throughout this day, be with us. And we need to know and recognize your voice, we, even when it's a whisper. God, and we need to, we need to uh, abstain from those things that would make a jealous husband get upset. Lord, help us in those things. Lord, and, and help us to just honor you in all things that we do. I just pray. We pray. In Jesus' name. Transition. 